endometrial or uterine polyps and what do they mean for your fertility. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I am a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor. And today I wanna to talk about endometrial polyps. This is something that I will diagnose in a bunch of my patients and it always causes anxiety. So I wanna break down what it is, how we diagnose it, what it means, and what we should do about it in a quick video. However, I'd love it if you would subscribe to the channel. I have worked so hard at making this channel a place for you to come for fertility facts and facts about your reproductive health. And the more subscribers we have, the easier it is for other people to find these videos and learn themselves. So if you appreciate this message or you're learning from these videos, please just hit that subscribe button so we can rank higher. All right, an endometrial polyp is a polyp, which is a projection of the endometrium or the lining of the uterus. Remember that the uterus has three layers. The outermost layer is called the serosa. The inner layer is the muscular layer, and that's the myometrium. And the very innermost layer is the endometrium, and that is the layer that we regenerate and we shut off every month when we have our period. So an endometrial polyp is a projection of extra endometrial tissue. Overall, polyps are rare in younger women. They tend to be present more as we get older. They also have a higher tendency if you are overweight, and that's because the fat cells make estrogen and estrogen can stimulate polyps to grow, or you have what we call unopposed estrogen. So for example, you have PCOS and you're not taking any type of progesterone, birth control pills, or anything, and you have very irregular periods. You then have a lot of unopposed estrogen, and that unopposed estrogen can stimulate polyp growth. The symptoms of polyps, number one, asymptomatic. They can cause no symptoms at all. They rarely cause any pain, so typically pain is not associated with polyps. One of the most common symptoms can actually be spotting or intermenstrual bleeding, so having some abnormal bleeding in between your periods. You also can have some heavy bleeding. So, oh, hey, my periods are now heavier than they used to be. You can have bleeding once you've already entered into menopause or ovarian failure. That would be highly suspicious. Or actually, infertility can sometimes be a symptom because polyps have been associated with infertility. The hypothesis for why polyps can impact your fertility is typically due to an inflammatory reaction. So the presence of a polyp inside the uterus, that's where a pregnancy wants to implant. So remember that egg and sperm meet in the fallopian tube and that is where fertilization happens. That embryo grows and develops over the course of the next five to six days until it reaches the uterine cavity. Once it's in the uterine cavity, then it is supposed to implant and it finds a nice little spot on the endometrium and then it starts to release these proteases which actually eat away at the wall of the uterus so that that little placenta can latch on and the embryo can implant and grow in. So when you have a polyp inside the uterus, it can cause a lot of inflammation. And we know this because if we do endometrial biopsies and we sample the tissue, we see high inflammatory markers or plasma cells inside the uterus of people who have a polyp. We also are curious if a polyp can change the receptivity. The endometrium is so amazing. It is very sensitive to progesterone. So I've got some videos on progesterone and implantation, but progesterone opens and closes what we call the implantation window, meaning the endometrium responds after a certain number of days of progesterone, and that's when a pregnancy can implant in, and then after too many days have gone on, it closes. So there's some thought that polyps actually shift that receptivity window. These two factors can lead to polyps causing infertility or lower pregnancy rates, making it harder to get pregnant, and also can be associated with an increase in miscarriage because inflammation or plasma cells has been associated with an increased prevalence of miscarriage. There have been studies done that have associated polyps with infertility or subfertility and shown improvement after removal. So there was a retrospective study published in 2020 looking at people who underwent fertility treatment. They had baseline ultrasounds or hysteroscopies and started an IUI cycle between 2009 and 2017. There were over 6,000 patients and 2% of them had a polyp. In these cycles, 
patients did not have the polyp removed and proceeded with IUI because they were already in IUI treatment. And the success rate, the pregnancy rate in the IUI group was 24% after three IUIs as compared to 33% in the group that did not have a polyp. There have been other studies. So another example of one is when 128 patients were found to have a polyp and they were randomized to removal or not removal prior to undergoing IUI. The live birth rate after four cycles of IUI was 38% in the group that had the polyps removed versus 18% in the group that did not. This was statistically significant and showed that these polyps had a negative impact on success rates. However, in IVF studies, when it comes to success rates after embryo transfer in patients who may have a polyp, small polyps have not consistently shown to be a problem, although larger ones do appear to be associated with recurrent implantation failure. There have been some observational studies looking at natural conception rates or fecundability before and after polypectomy, and it did show that polypectomy improved natural fertility rates. So this might be something that could be contributing to unexplained infertility or subfertility. In one study with an endometrial polyp, it looks like pregnancy rates were reported between 50 to 76% after polypectomy in patients who were previously deemed infertile or unable to get pregnant. To me, this literature supports that in natural and IUI conceptions, removing polyps makes a lot of sense before attempting pregnancy or if you experience infertility. It also might suggest that in IVF cycles, removing polyps is important. I will tell you it is relatively standard practice for most of us to remove polyps that we find, and it also is standard practice to try to look for polyps on imaging. So before you have an embryo transfer or if you go see a fertility doctor in general, we typically are going to do some imaging imaging of the uterine cavity. A polyp can sometimes be seen on ultrasound, and this is an example of when you can see one. When you see it on ultrasound like this, it usually means it's rather large, and you would subsequently want to follow up with hysteroscopy, which is a camera inside the uterus. Hysteroscopy is both diagnostic and therapeutic, meaning we can confirm it's a polyp and we can take it out immediately. You also can find polyps on three-dimensional ultrasound, on saline sonography, or even on an HSG test, which it might result as a filling defect and be nonspecific, but commonly that could be a polyp. It is estimated that about 10% of the general population may have an endometrial polyp, and that prevalence may be higher if you do have symptoms such as infertility or bleeding. So up to 20 to 30% of people who have abnormal bleeding patterns may have a polyp, or if you have infertility, 16 to 46% of patients were found to have a polyp. Almost all polyps, especially when found as a part of a workup for infertility, are benign. Occasionally polyps can be cancerous, especially if you're older or you have other risk factors. And so it is important to have a polyp removed if it's persistently there, if you're older or if your doctor recommends it. Most of the time, the surgery to remove a polyp, it can sometimes be done in office without even fully anesthesia. I do them in an operating room with anesthesia. There's no right or wrong. It just makes it better for you to be able to undergo the whole process. And so that surgery is relatively simple. A hysteroscope goes in, you can see the polyps. They can be cut with scissors, grass with graspers. You can sometimes use cautery or even a morselation device. The procedure typically just takes minutes. Then you're awoken and you can carry on with your fertility treatments or whatever your next step is. I hope you found this video helpful. As always, I'd love it if you would follow along and you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or you can follow on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thanks, friends.